DATV. And the Greater Dayton Area League of Women Voters present Meet the Candidates. Hello, I am Peggy Berry. I am a member of the League of Women Voters of the Greater Dayton Area. I am here today with candidates running for the office of the Dayton City Commission. There are seven candidates running for the two open seats. These candidates are Stacy Benson Taylor, Valerie Duncan, Daryl Fairchild, Jared Gray Grandy, uh, Scott Sliver, Shanice Turner Sloss, and Jordan Wortham. Mr. Jordan Wortham, a candidate for this position, regrets that they could not be here because of a prior commitment. We will start our interviews by having the candidates tell us about themselves and why they have they want to serve the position of the Dayton City Commissioner. I'm going to start with uh, Valerie. Okay, thank you. And good morning to everybody. And thank you for the League of Women Voters to have this forum this morning. Yes, I was raised in a labor family. My father went to uh, work for the Hobart Scales on Huffman. I remember how many jobs there were back then. It, we, had, uh, we had Hobart, we had NCR, we had all these um, Brigadaire, General Motors, McCall's. And, and so I remember from my childhood, <laughs> Our, our stability of our of our neighborhoods and that's why I want to serve because now I and, and and I also served 31 years in the city of Dayton so I know the operations I know the procedures and the policies and what departments do what who's responsible for what and it's under a city management form of government the the city manager is the chief operating officer and I want to bring uh, to Dayton, I'm supporting a strong neighborhoods, um, jobs, creating yeah. jobs, and quality of water. I think our, our water, uh, there's too many chemicals getting in our water and we need to address it. There's too many dilapidated houses. We need to address that. Thank and we need to create jobs. It's time to move to our next candidate. And uh, Jared Grandy. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for having me and good morning. I thank the League of Women Voters for all that you do. I think it's important what you do, um, uh, engaging people and educating people about the candidates. My name is Jared Grandy. I'm a lifelong Daytonian. I was born and raised here, graduated from Meadowdale High School in 2006. I uh, went to St. Clair Community College, then to University of Cincinnati, where I majored in criminal justice. I uh, eventually earned a uh, scholarship to Northern Kentucky School of Law. Um, after law school, I came back to the city of Dayton, worked for an organization called the Urban League, where I mentored and coached youth um, and with job development um, and youth counseling. Um, after the Urban League, I worked for the city of Dayton as the community police relations coordinator. Uh, there, I had the opportunity to work on the most pressing political issue of a decade, and that's community police relations. Um, I got the chance to see the, um, the drive and the intellectual capacity um, the brilliance of our citizens, and but unfortunately, a lot of our conversations stuck in a boardroom. And I'm here to build a pipeline between the community and the city of Dayton as an organization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Shanice Turner Sloss. Yes, good morning. I want to say thank you to the League of Women, Women Voters for hosting this forum. forum. Uh, we appreciate all of your your hard work and your commitment to making sure that the residents in not only the city of Dayton, but Montgomery County in, in its entirety are well-informed voters. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. Again, my name is Shanice Turner Sloss, running for Dayton City Commission. And I will start off by saying, this is not my first uh, rodeo, uh, for the lack of, of better terms to use. I've ran, this is my third time actually running for Dayton City Commission. I think that speaks to my persistence uh, it speaks to my commitment for the city of Dayton and where I believe that the city should be moving forward as it relates to making sure that we have and, and we put policy in place to um, to govern, to have our uh, residents as and treat them as a, a priority, which we've gotten away from. 
Um, I have an extensive background that speaks to my experience as a former city of Dayton employee. I currently work for Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. I'm Thank excited. you very much, Shanice. I'm sorry. You're... Okay. okay, Scott uh, Sliver, please. <laughs> very good. Thank you. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for uh, this opportunity to share with you. My name is Scott Sliver. I have a professional background in advertising and marketing. I had major accounts such as Kings Island, Holiday Inn, Merrill Lynch, and several local uh, accounts that are no longer here. Businesses like Delco Products, Inland Corporation, and NCR. I'm senior associate pastor at Dayton Vineyard Church, a church that I helped to found 30 years ago. I still serve there. I've been running a mobile food pantry for the past 10, maybe 12 years that has provided groceries uh, in Green and Montgomery County to uh, nearly 1,000 families every month. I've been appointed to the Landmarks Commission, which oversees the 14 historic districts in Dayton. I've been appointed to the Community Police Council, which is under the Human Relations Council. Been doing that for three and a half years. I've also been in one of the police reform working groups, which was community engagement since last summer. Um, I serve on the executive board of the Dayton Unit NAACP, where I handle communication, press, and publicity. Been mentoring yeah. kids in DTS. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You so much. Thank you. <laughs> Stacy Benson. Good morning and thank you for having us today. Again, my name is Stacy Benson Taylor and I am the candidate for city commission that can be a bridge to a brighter future, building on what has worked in our city and improving what has not. Um, I believe that passion plus experience equals progress. We have a lot of candidates that love the city of Dayton and have a lot of passion for the city of Dayton, but it is my experience. Um, I recently left my job at AFSCME uh, Ohio Council 8, which is the union that represents public employees in this county um, and throughout this, this region, to run for Dayton City Commission um, because I believe in this city and I believe in where we can go. Um, I have represented the employees at the city of Dayton for 15 years through two recessions, the loss of the major airlines, the closing of the convention center or transfer of the convention center, and through the COVID pandemic. And I believe it is that experience that I have that will make me a great Dayton City Commissioner. Thank you so much, Stacy. And last but not least, uh, Daryl Fairchild. Thank you, Peggy, and thank you, Chris, and the League of Women Voters. I'm a proud member of the League and I've and valued the work that we've done in the past. I'm Commissioner Daryl Fairchild. I'm running for re-election as I approach my third anniversary. It's clear that I've been tested by fire. My term of service has been one of the most difficult in generations. Through it, I have been a responsible and responsive leader. I'm the only candidate for commission that has this type of experience. I'm a lifelong Daytonian, a product of DPS, including my experience of mandatory busing beginning in fifth grade. That experience helped me to see Dayton through many eyes. I was fortunate that my family had all that we needed. Living on the color and economic line, I had classmates who did not have enough and friends in the suburbs who had more than they needed. This experience shaped me and led me to become a minister and a public servant. I grew up in Dayton and for the last 20 years, I've lived in Dayton View Triangle. I'm the manager of Dayton Children's Hospital, which gives me a unique perspective into what our families face. I'm a father and I, we have three cats and I'm an avid <laughs> hand cyclist. Thank you, you know, so much, Foster, Mr. Simpler, Fairchild. Simple recipe. I'm Thank sorry, you. we will need to move on. Uh, I will be asking, uh, you questions and this will uh, give you two minutes to respond uh, per candidate per question. And Mr. Fairchild, since I, I uh, let you go last, the, I will uh, ask you the first question. The American Rescue Plan will provide the city of Dayton with an estimated $147 million. What would be your priorities for utilizing these funds? Thank you. That is the most important question that these we as candidates need to answer in this election. That $147 million is an incredible opportunity. And in some ways, it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. Because while that money's coming in, we also need to be mindful that COVID is going to impact our general fund because of how we rely on income tax. And we don't know yet how um, that's going to impact us with people doing commuting from, from home. And so we don't yet know how our general fund is going to be impacted. So it's going to be 
important that we use those funds judiciously and look for one-time uses. I've already worked with the city manager. She's laid out a plan and I think the plan is right. It identifies our neighborhoods. This has been a passion of mine. Since I've been on commission, we've been able to create a vision plan that lays out what is possible for our neighborhoods. Now we have the opportunity to actually put resources and implement behind it. One of the most important things that, to use this dollars for is gonna be around housing. We have demolished a lot of homes. What we haven't done is the other side of the equation to do significant neighborhood development. And that's gonna be key going forward. We need to invest some of that dollars into encouraging new home buyers into the area, capture home buyers who are buying homes in our region that we haven't been able to attract. We need to help some of our seniors stay in place by investing in their homes so that they have a safe and healthy place to live and their neighbors can um, not have their value use brought down because they're unable to care for their homes. We need to invest in our um, neighborhood business corridors and in businesses that can be there. We started the arcade. We need to make real our promise to make sure that that entre entrepreneurial spirit gets into our neighborhoods and to local businesses and so that they can populate some of these spaces that we're going to be able to create. Thank you, Mr. Fairchild. Uh, Shanice Turner Sloss, um, do I need to repeat the question? The American Rescue Plan will provide the city of Dayton with an estimated $147 million. What would your priorities be to utilize these funds? I appreciate that question. And so Dayton is at a pivotal point, considering the fact that we are in the global pandemic. But we have to also have to look at pre-COVID and all of the different things that we experienced, the traumatic events that occurred in the city of Dayton. But let me just say this, in all candidacy and, and transparency, I do not trust the administration, the current administration that we have in place to disseminate those dollars for the best interest and the will of the people in the city of Dayton. Reason being, we have seen in past practices that the city of Dayton have squandered dollars from $425,000 of our federal funds. We have seen our current administration squander dollars of $625,000 that was used, our reserve funds that was used for emergencies for the, uh, the May riots, uh, the, um, the alt-right that came to the city of Dayton. So my point is this, we need progressive leadership in place, such as myself, to make sure that those dollars are used effectively. For one, the priority needs to be on the residents. So what does that look like? Investing in our neighborhoods, making sure that we have low interest loans and under my plan, under my leadership, we have an initiative called Fix My Block. That initiative will allow residents to build the equity in their homes, to make sure that we are having the funds available to replace roofing and, and gutters and all of the different things that go along with home ownership. We have to make Dayton attractive. And so with that $147 million that we have coming into our community, this is an opportunity for us to do right by our residents for us to right our wrongs and to start investing in the people in this community. It also starts with us investing in our small and minority businesses. We've gotten away from that. We need to make sure that we are providing the tools, the policy and the programming to put the people first. We also need to make sure that we're investing in our major corridors. We've gotten thank, away from thank that. Thank you, Mrs. Turner Sloss. Okay, uh, Mr. Scott Sliver. Do I need to repeat the question or are you okay no, with it? No, nope, okay. I'm good. Um, certainly recovery from the budget crisis due to the pandemic is priority number one. Uh, there's a, uh, been a lot of talk about the lack of funding that was put toward the Human Relations Council. Uh, so that being fully funded, that is the hot button issue uh, in Dayton right now. We have to make sure that that happens. I've been on the Community Police Council for over three years and served on a community uh, engagement police reform working group. Uh, the city cut its budget across the board, 15 to 20%, it's $18 million. It's gonna take time to recover from that loss of revenue, but we have to continue, and the city has to continue providing the same quality of essential services to our community. Having said that, that $147 million, it's critical that every citizen and every neighborhood benefits from that money. And if elected, I will fight to ensure that that happens. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Sliver. Uh, Mr. Grandy, uh, same question. The American Rescue Plan will provide the city of Dayton with an estimated $147 million. What would your priorities be for utilizing these funds? As mentioned before, this is a one-time use. We, we get this pot of money one time, so there's no room for error. And we have to have um, leaders that we can trust to spend this money in a way that's going to benefit our community for years to come. Um, so we have to invest it in a sustainable way. And one, a few ways we can do that. We can invest in community development. We can invest in our neighborhoods and we can invest in our people, particularly our young people. If you look at my platform, public safety and community police relations are at, at the very top. Um, but these issues are related. We have to give our young people something to do. If you look at our youth and rec services budget, it's abysmal. We need to properly fund um, our, our, our uh, youth and rec services department as well as our community development department because these are the things that are going to ultimately make our city more beautiful and more safe. Um, and, and therefore, we need to use that money to properly invest. Um, also, we need to invest in our green infrastructure. Uh, if we Make sure that our green infrastructure is um, uh, put in place. Ultimately, Daytonians, Daytonians will save money and they can use that money to invest in their homes and invest in their community. Um, so that that will have a long term impact for years to come. Plus, the city of Dayton would do its part to protect our environment because we have to protect our environment uh, or it won't take care of us. Um, and also uh, get rid of the, the landfills and uh, the unofficial landfills and the unofficial dumping sites that are in residential neighborhoods. It, it, it's atrocious, it lowers property values, and it lowers morale. These are the things that we can invest in that will create a long-term um, sustainable plan and, and attract residents and keep residents here. Um, yeah, there's no wrong to get this wrong, and we need new leadership that you can trust to spend this money for the people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Grandy. Um, Valerie Duncan, do I need to repeat the question for you? Uh, no, I, I understand it. Okay. Yes, we uh, we have an opportunity with that $146 million to invest in, in our neighborhoods, in our quality of water, in jobs, in job training. And we need to do a, a thorough review uh, through the city manager and through the uh, various departments, they they have a uh, a budget review. We need to go back and and uh, even though they're, they're just actually completing that process, we need to go back to it. We have a lot of different plans, strategic plans, the 2020 strategic plans, and we need to kind of like look at them and dust them off. But our basic services for fire, police, emergency, and housing. Housing inspection, housing is a safety and health issue, right up there with fire and police. Uh, under the charter, uh, we, uh, the city commission is responsible for, for the, to maintain uh, health and safety. Now, uh, as far as with, with, what to do with the money, yes, uh, some of our departments are stripped out um, in, under the department where uh, housing division, it's a skeleton crew. There's other skeleton crews and, and that they can't operate effectively and efficiently. And that's what's been the problem with why our housing is so dilapidated and run down. There's thousands of houses out there just standing open or some of them are boarded over 10 years. I know a lady, she lives right next to a house that's been boarded up. There's other communities I've, I've been all around and I, I see them for myself. So that, that should be the number one priority. We're not gonna have a, a vital, uh, can't put vitality back into the neighborhoods if we don't have stable neighborhoods. Mrs. Duncan, um, Mrs. Benson, do you have, uh, do I need to repeat the question? No, that's, thank you. Okay. Uh, so what we need to do is we need to look at the city budget holistically. $147 million absolutely is a lot of money. Um, but we also have to be mindful that the original CARES Act did not do any revenue replacement. So while 
they were lo- while we were losing jobs in the city and income tax is what pays for city jobs, um, we were not getting any revenue with that CARES Act. And so this current act does allow for revenue replacement and we need to be mindful of that, that there were over a hundred jobs, vacant positions that were abolished. That is a lot of services that we are not able to provide. And so when looking at the budget and balancing the budget, we must make sure that our waste collection department is fully staffed, that our water departments are fully staffed, because that is the city infrastructure. And then we must then look at how we balance the, those are mandated statutory services that the city is required to provide. And the federal, the state government has cut the local government fund by 50%. So we are already providing services or required to provide services that are not fully funded. And so once we figure out that part of the budget, then we need to look at where we can invest in our communities and connect those two dots. We have to make sure that we are fully funding um, the city departments, but we also have to make sure that we are taking that money, investing in our children, investing in um, demolishing houses, investing in um, recreation, investing in building our neighborhoods from the inside out. Strong neighborhoods help community growth. And so that would be my plan with the money. Thank you very much. Um, For my second question, um, Mr. Sliver, I will pick on you first. Uh, The question is, what can the city do to promote the expansion of housing in the city? Well, they've certainly done uh, a great job of promoting housing downtown. Uh, Downtown is flourishing. And because of that, uh, our city has experienced its first uptick of uh, population since the 1960s, since, you know, since I was a kid, um, our population has actually grown in large part due to the the work that's been done downtown. Everyone knows, I mean, I live out, uh, I live in the Wolf Creek neighborhood and there are dilapidated houses everywhere. Uh, The, you know, that hurts people's property values. Uh, The city, um, I know that, that there's a plan in place to Uh, take care of the blighted properties, but it's not happening fast enough. Uh, Hopefully some of that uh, 147 million will go to that to just make the city uh, more attractive to to folks that want to move here. Uh, Obviously, uh, taking care of our schools, you know, Dayton Public Schools has its own school board, but everyone looks to the city commission, you know, we are the leaders of the city, and we certainly need to partner with Dayton Public School Board to ensure that you know the schools are top notch to attract young families to to want to come to our city i'm on the landmarks commission that oversees the 14 historic districts and you know there are some uh tight guidelines in place which people appreciate because uh, they can't just go in and paint their house whatever color they can't just swap out cheap windows and different things and that has certainly helped the property values uh uh, in the historic districts, and hopefully that will spread out into uh, the various neighborhoods. So there you go. That's my answer to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sliver. Um, Ms. Ms. Turner-Sloss, same question. What can the city do to promote the expansion of housing in the city? Well, I think we have ha- answered that question in a nutshell. The first thing that we need to do is we need a, a comprehensive plan for our neighborhoods, which we have not seen. We have seen a lot of development downtown. And I find it interesting because again, everything that everyone is saying on this on this panel today is the same thing I've been saying for the last 15 years. We need to do a better job than what we're currently doing, uh, rightfully so. We've invested all of our resources downtown protecting our core while the shell is continuously crumbling. So how do we invest in our housing? How do we promote home ownership in the city of Dayton? We need to put funding in that place. We need to make sure that we're funding the Dayton Home Ownership Center to encourage people to wanna live in the city of Dayton. We also need to make sure that we have low low interest loans, grants available to encourage home ownership. We need to make Dayton attractive. We've gotten away from making Dayton a place that people want to live, grow, and work, and and continue to uh, build their families and their businesses. The first thing we need to do again is, and I will not deviate from that, and I have been saying that for quite some time, we have to invest in the people and the neighborhoods. 
that in turn will encourage people to want to live in the city of Dayton. The last thing I'll say this is the development that we've seen downtown, it's sparking a huge surge in housing development. But we have to look at the fact that those who are living downtown, who are we attracting with homes at the price range of 200 up to $400,000. The average income for the city of Dayton res residents is 27 to $28,000. We have to put the people in this community first, and we need to make sure that we get away from this lopsided governing and really start putting the funding in our neighborhoods and making opportunities and policies that will align with the progressive way of how we do business in the city of Dayton. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Turner Sloss. Uh, Jared Grandy, do I need to repeat the question? Um, no, I'm okay. Uh, okay. We need to invest in our infrastructure for one. Um, I have a lot of family and friends who live in Centerville, Miamisburg, Huber Heights, um, Beaver Creek, et cetera. And, and I've been an ambassador for Dayton saying, come move back, please move back. We can use your tax dollars. We, we can use your <laughs> brain power. Uh, uh, we could just use the resources that you bring to our city. However, I always get pushback. And one of the uh, main pushback I get is simply our roads, right? Our, our main infrastructure, our main corridors, Salem Avenue, um, Main Street, Kiwi, Wayne, um, Gettysburg, James H. McGee, uh, those are, are crumbling and sometimes they're an off-road experience. Um, so when they come to the city to visit me or other family members, they, they have that bad experience just getting off the highway and traveling to the neighborhoods. Um, so we definitely need to invest in our roads and our infrastructure. Um, and we need to beautify those corridors. If people are coming uh, to the city of Dayton to invest and they, they see um, a dilapidated property, vacant fields, um, uh, uh, dump sites, um, they're not going to want to invest. It's not, it's not going to seem like a, a good investment. So we certainly need to um, invest in our, our, our infrastructure and beautification projects, um, as well as become a cooler city, in my opinion. Um, if we become a green city, um, I think that will attract people. Uh, if we, we improve our public transportation system, I think that will be attractive to people. Um, as well as invest in things to do. Um, we have a lot of arts and culture in our city and I think we need to lean into that. And I think that could attract people. But lastly, um, the schools. The city commission doesn't um, control education policy, but we do need to work closely with our school board um, so that we can create an education policy that will improve our, our, um, our performance um, and therefore attract families. Thank you, Mr. Grandy. Uh, Stacy Benson. Um, yes. Do I need to repeat the question? No, thank you. Okay. So in order to attract, uh, attract and build in our neighborhoods, um, we have to recreate what has worked. Um, and that is looking at what we did downtown, looking at what has been done in other areas and, and, and recreating that. We've lost some important programs through the county as well as the city, the reprogram, um, lot links, things like that, that helped people who may not have had the resources to go out and spend $200,000 on property. So we need to look at working with the county, which I've done the last 15 years um, as the rep union representative to figure out how we recreate programs that allow people to buy, rebuild, um, and update their properties. Um, we also have to look again, as, as many of the candidates have said, at infrastructure. Investing in infrastructure means investing in the workforce. Um, at one point, there were 1,500 employees, bargaining unit employees in the city. We are down to a little over, or asked me again as I left, um, they're down to a little over 700 people doing the same work. And so if we want to beautify our cities, then we have to invest in our workforce so that we do start to build and take care of those roads and take care of the waste and take care of the things that make the city more attractive. And so I believe that that beautification and all of those things, infrastructure um, allows us to create neighborhoods. And again, investing in strong neighborhoods, building our neighborhoods from the inside out. Thank you, Ms. Benson. Uh, Ms. Duncan. 
Yes. Now the question was about housing. What what can Is the it? city do to promote the expansion of housing in the city? Okay, yeah, yes. Get into housing. Thank you. Everything. Thank you. Um, I said I think yes, you um, to get in the habit of repeating every question for us. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'm ready to answer the question. Oh, yes, we. Uh, is it my turn to speak? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, uh, housing is should be the number one issue right up there with uh, fire and police. And we there's so many different avenues that we can tackle this problem. And uh, we need to form a, 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 a strategy a strategic plan to address all of the issues regarding housing. And one of them, of course, is the, the blight, all the thousands of houses that are, are standing vacant. So what do we do with those houses? Yes, yeah, some of them need to be torn down, but there's opportunities to turn some of those houses around and provide programs at which we did in the 80s. When I worked for the Frog Priority Board, there were several, several programs that the city had to help city residents acquire these houses, these dilapidated houses, and through citywide and other type of development corporations, we were able to provide low interest loans so that they had the ability to fix these properties up. And so there's so many more other programs that are out there that exist, the neighbor to neighbor program, for the uh, community action agency, and we need to kind of build up on, on those where the neighbor to neighbor helps the senior citizens and low interest, low income families, uh, same uh, that, uh, for the uh, community action, and, and start investing those $146 million into programs like that so that residents can get their houses fixed and that we can turn around these low in, uh, these dilapidated houses and get them into the hands of our, of our low income residents along with other uh, income residents, particularly the laborers Thank that are- Thank you, Mr. Duncan. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, uh, I'll repeat the question. I wanna make sure I haven't forgotten anybody. I think Mr. Fairchild has not answered yet. So the question is, what can the city do to promote the expansion of housing in the city? Thank you, Peggy. Well, um, this is where being a commissioner gives me some experience. People have talked in generalities. I can talk in specifics. We have the UDA plan that's coming to completion. This was a visioning plan for all of our neighborhoods. And so we have a clear vision of what can be done in our neighborhoods. You can see some opportunities from that planning particularly looking at the planning that we've already done in Miami Chapel through the Choice Neighborhoods, which is a HUD funded implementation grant or um, planning grant. I think now with this 174 or $147 million, we have the opportunity to have the leverage in there to complete an implementation grant and build out housing within that Germantown, Miami Chapel um, area, that um, business corridor and with um, economy Lennon building a new plant that's going to put 70 new workers there. We have an opportunity because here's the key question about expanding housing. You got to know who your buyers are. And so these new employees at Economy Lennon are potential homeowners right in that neighborhood. And so we could do a, a housing project. It would make sense in conjunction with the planning that's already been done with the Miami Chapel plan um, there. Likewise, we know that a lot of our um, citizens are working in those fulfillment jobs. Now those jobs only make about $33,000. So we would have to come in and help provide some subsidies, but you could imagine a plan that would take advantage of the new library going in um, in West Dayton and the neighborhoods of, West, um, of, of, um, of Westwood and Residence Park and identifying housing around that new library and those assets that, like the Westwood School in close proximity to the bus hub that could then get um, workers out. The um, Akron has done work to attract new um, homeowners. 
We haven't done that work so we could replicate what they do. And Milwaukee has had a great plan in Sherman Park where they were able to do- um, Thank you, Mr. Fairchild. <laughs> okay. The next question is, what will you do to promote transparency and open communication with citizens? Uh, Ms. Turner Sloss, I'd like you to answer that question first. Yes, thank you, Ms. Peggy. So that's a great question. So my background and how I started with the city of Dayton is through the priority board system. Um, I actually was a community service advisor. So I know the importance of having the citizens actively engaged in the process and having conversations with them about what they want and how do we address the ills in our community. I find it interesting that we have a UDA plan, but yet and still, have and were the residents at the table, were they able to provide their input? Did they give certain situations on what uh, areas in the neighborhood that they wanted addressed? We do have 65 neighborhoods. And although we have some similar concerns and issues, every neighborhood is different. And so we need to make sure that for one, we encourage uh, residents to be actively engaged in the political process, not just during voting, but we also need to make sure that when plans and decisions are being made, they have a seat at the table. And so how do we do that? We reinstitute the uh, priority board system. Now there were some flaws and there was some different areas that are needed for improvement, but this is the time for us to do it. Dayton is at a pivotal point right now. We've seen that over the summer of protests. We've seen that under the uh, past administration and the people in this community, they want to be involved. They want to hold uh, the elected officials accountable. And so we need to make it as a streamlined process to give them the opportunity to do so, so that we can have transparent, responsible government in place that will answer the call of duty and whatever those concerns may be from the, the residents in the city. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Siver, I will ask you the same question. What can the city, uh, I'm sorry, what will you do to promote transparency and open communication with the citizens? Uh, thank you for that question. Um, well, my professional background is in advertising, marketing, and communications. Um, I started my career in direct marketing specifically. Um, I believe that uh, that experience will come in very handy as a city commissioner. Um, I think the city could do a much better job of just communicating with citizens beyond, uh, beyond putting something on Facebook or slapping it on the website or even sending out uh, a, a newsletter. Um, I know those are all good mechanisms to communicate, but it needs to be broadened uh, to make sure that we reach everybody. I mean, even basic information about how the budget works and how, uh, how different departments are funded, why they cut this or what the priorities are, how I think most citizens, they, they have some idea of how COVID has impacted the budget, but they may not really fully understand it. Uh, the city could give information on uh, specific projects that have been funded and why, including most recently, there's misinformation flying all over the place about the police reform that there's only been 100 uh, recommendations or that there have been 100 recommendations and only one has been funded. And it, those numbers are just off. Um, but the city could do a better job of communicating that, hey, 85 have been implemented and there's another 35 or 40 that are about to be implemented and when they're going to be funded and how. Um, I think the city could communicate better where community grants have been awarded into which neighborhoods because everybody believes theirs is the only neighborhood or that all the neighborhoods don't get anything and that's that's not the case um how like uh even how many miles of road have been paved since the passage uh of the of the tax hike you know um people just don't know that i mean there have been major intersections paved how many miles of road have been paved and how many Miles are left. Thank you, Mr. Sliver. Um, Ms. Duncan, what will you do to promote transparency and open communication for citizens? Okay, well, I hope that the, uh, the form of government that we have, which is a, a city manager uh, form, a city manager, city commission form of government remains in place. That will definitely ensure that we have transparency uh, 
a while the operating chief operating officer, which is the city manager, to uh, run the department. And and uh, as far as with the city commission, then it's our job to see that the city manager is doing their job and that we share information on the budget process, involve people in, in the budget process. I know when, when uh, we did have priority boards, they were involved in the budget process. And um, so that's what we need. One of the things we need to do as far as transparency. And um, when we um, appoint people to, to boards and, and we need to then uh, say who they, these people are. We need to have those, those listed uh, in uh, whether it, whatever it is, the land use uh, or um, board of, uh, board of um, zoning, uh, whatever those boards are. And, um, and we have to then ensure the city commission can ensure uh, diversity and transparency at the same time. If we, if we want transparency, then we have to have diversity right at the very beginning. So all the players that should, that need to be involved with uh, whatever it is uh, issue uh, then needs to be at the table. So if uh, we want police reform, we need to have the police and fire involved because they're, they're a player. They, then that, that then creates transparency and it creates diversity. Thank you, Mrs. Duncan. Uh, Mr. Fairchild, that question was, what will you do to promote transparency and open communication with citizens? Thank you, Peggy. Well, as I've been on the commission for three years, it was certainly a concern that I had when I came onto the commission and it's one that I've tried to advance while I've been there. Um, I think the best thing that we can do is to be honest and respectful of our citizens and when we're not to apologize and work to do better. There have been times where we've done a good job of communicating and there's times when we haven't. And in those times when we haven't, I've spoken up. I can think around the, uh, the new prairie and our development out there. I don't think we were fully forthcoming with our citizens on that. And I spoke up and said so. Likewise, we had a resident who came forward to talk about the blight in our community. I didn't think that we gave him due respect and I spoke up um, and said so and even put forward a plan on our housing, which now sets us up if we had um, enacted it or uh, moved on it, we would be in a better place now to use our $147 million. Uh, most recently, we had an incident where citizen comments weren't forward to the commissioners in a timely manner before a meeting. It might, it, it is most likely an honest error, but the result's the same. It, it, um, it, it impacted our citizens who wanted to speak and be heard and they weren't. And I was the only commissioner who stood up and said that was wrong and we need to apologize. I think when you do something wrong, you apologize and make a commitment to do better. So I have a track record of trying to bring transparency to the city commission, I'll keep to do so. I think people are right that the priority board system, once it was done away with, we did not do enough to um, put something in its place to um, strengthen citizen engagement. And we need to do that. Um, that's something I've been working on. I'm, I'm hopeful, but I think as everyone says, in all of these things, we need to make sure we keep our eyes on it. And uh, there's a, the community development uh, department is working on a new plan for citizen engagement. But we have to listen to our citizens. We had one process where our citizens came and said, clearly we want funding for youth and we didn't listen to them. Thank you very much, Mr. Fairchild. Uh, Ms. Benson, what will you do to promote transparency and open communication with citizens? So one of the things is that we have to start doing is looking at where the information is disseminated. Um, I know that we can go to the website and I know that we can go a bunch of different places and look for this information. But if we are not reaching the citizens, then we are basically not giving the information. And so we have to do a true assessment of where this information um, is, is being disseminated and how people are receiving it. I believe we need to have community hubs for communication, um, how that information gets out there. So in addition to um, creating or recreating community organizations that are a direct pipeline to the city, such as the priority boards work, um, I think we also need to use our community centers as um, communication hubs. 
so that we have a direct connection outside of the priority boards, um, where our citizens go, where they work, where they play. They, that should be a connection to what's happening in the city as well. The other thing that I would like to do is create and, and I don't have a name for it, I think I'll say the Innovation Council, um, because I think we need to not only hear what the citizens want to see but I, in their government, but I also think we need to make sure that the citizens understand how this process worked. When I joined the West Dayton Steering, um, the West Dayton Development Steering Committee, um, I learned that it took Brown Street, it was 17 years in the making from the first conversation to the ground being broke. We don't know that as citizens that there is a process in place. And so we need to make sure that we are educating as well as listening to what our citizens need and want. And so that there is a direct connection. And so I'd like to see this innovation council that has high school students, college students, young professionals, and some of us senior soldiers so that we can um, come together with our ideas and our visions for the city and Thank you, create Mrs. that Benson. communication. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Uh, Mr. Grandy, what will you do to promote transparency and open communication with our citizens? Yes, ma'am. First of all, I'll start with making sure we comply with the laws already in place. Um, unfortunately, I, I hate to say that we've uh, done a lot of circumventing um, our sunshine laws. People make public records requests. Um, uh, with regard to particular activity in departments within a city and um, the response is either vague or or, or, or city has been non-responses. For instance, I have a friend who asked about the number of no bid contracts. No bid contracts are contracts given without going to the public bidding process. Um, and when uh, he asked for that information, the response was that that, uh, that, that um, question is too voluminous um, and uh, people are still seeking answers. Um, to that particular question. So one, comply with the sunshine laws that are already on the books. Um, two, I, I'm going to be voting yes for Charter Amendment 5, which allows digital meetings. However, we need to make sure that um, we don't use this di these digital platforms to circumvent uh, the, the opportunity for citizens to engage. Uh, Commissioner Fairchild mentioned uh, the uh, incident earlier. I, honestly, I don't believe that was an honest mistake. Um, I, I think that the comments weren't favorable um, to the initiative that was brought forth. Um, however, moving forward, we just have to make sure that people are heard and engaged. That's a common sense charter amendment It's for the 21st century, but because we are in the 21st century, we need to develop the communication for the 20, 21st century. We need to use our social media platforms more. We need to use digital platforms. There are ways to engage uh, citizens um, taking advantage of the technology that we have. Um, finally, I think we need to budget our values. If we value people, then we need to um, fund the, the departments that are um, designed to talk to people, i.e. our community development department. That budget has been slashed and we need to use incoming funds to, to refund it. Thank you very much, Mr. Grady. In closing, we would like to provide each candidate with time for a closing statement, which will be two minutes. Uh, Mr. Sliver, would you please begin? Yeah, thank you. Uh, this has been great. It's always good to get the opportunity for people to get uh, the opportunity to hear from all the various candidates. Um, I'm running because the people that I have been serving over the last 30 years, and most recently, last 10 to 12 years as I've been running a mobile food pantry called the Hope Foundation of Greater Dayton, uh, I would have people come up to me at an outreach um, on a Saturday morning, could be 30 degrees and snowing, could be 90 degrees and, and pouring rain, and people would ask me, hey, have you ever thought about running for office? The city uh, could really use somebody like you. Um, I know a lot of people care but these folks know that I care. They know that I care about them. I, I, I am a big picture person, but I also uh, love helping the one. I had a woman reach out to me uh, six years ago when I was running for city commission back then. Uh, her name is Lindsay. She had an issue with her water. Uh, she was desperate. I met her for coffee. I offered to help. Um, she kept my campaign sign in her yard for more than three years until it was tattered because she just appreciated somebody spending the time with her who was willing to listen, 
I, I have the connections. Um, I have the relationships to get things done and people want to work with me. Um, I'm going to give my phone number. You can call me. It's 937-949-1449. You can call me or email me at scott at electscottsliver.com. I'm eager to hear the issues that are important to you and I'm willing to put in the work to uh, get things done and I'm asking for your vote on May 4th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sliver, Sliver. Uh, Ms. Benson. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Um, I, you know, I just want to reiterate, everybody loves the city of Dayton or we wouldn't be doing this. And so it is important to, um, to have people who want to be active and engaged in this process. So I commend everybody who has stepped outside of the box to enter. Um, but I want to make sure that, you know, I present, I am the candidate that has dealt with the budgets. Um, other than Commissioner Fairchild, I, he's been in the scenes, I've been behind the scenes. Um, working through the issues and the challenges that the city has faced. Um, part of representing these employees means that I have to understand not just the budget and the, the funding, but I have to understand the services that must be provided to our citizens and how we do that and what that workforce looks like. I have committed my life to working and serving. I spent 10 years at the Public Defender's Office before coming to work at the union. I've worked with juvenile delinquents. I've worked with families whose children have been removed by children's services. And I've worked with working families and trying to meet their needs. All of these people live in the city of Dayton. So I have built relationships with people that um, benefit from the work that is done at City Hall. And so I've decided that I want to advocate not just from the perspective of what is important to working families, but what is important to the working families and the citizens here in the city of Dayton. I believe that I can be a bridge to um, balancing the budget and maintaining staffing and vital services. I can be a bridge to more economic development and building our community from the inside out. When we own our neighborhoods, we take pride in our neighborhoods. And so I believe that I can be a bridge to a brighter future for Dayton and build on what has worked and improve what has not. Thank you, Ms. Benson. Um, Mr. Grandy. Thank you, Peggy, for hosting um, your excellent moderator. Thank you, uh, League of Women Voters, um, for hosting this forum and doing everything you do to educate voters. Um, again, I'm running because, as, as Stacy said, we're all passionate. We're all passionate. Um, but I have to say, I worked for the city for three and a half years, and it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure working with the city. It was a pleasure working with the residents. However, sometimes it was necessary to go against the grain to push the city forward. And that's what I've been dedicated to doing. I've done it when I worked with the city, and I've done it after I resigned um, in the midst of the George Floyd protest. Um, I'm committed to pushing this city forward and advocating on behalf of our residents, um, our young people, our, our uh, marginalized communities, our LGBTQ plus communities, communities of color, um, et cetera. Um, I think that we have an opportunity here to move Dayton into the 21st century in a substantial way that's going to make us stand out in the state of Ohio and indeed the nation. Uh, we have a history of innovation. Um, I think we need to tap into that spirit. We have a, a, a history of arts and culture. Uh, we just named Hillcrest Ohio Players Way, rightfully so. Um, and I think we need to lean into that. They needs to make its mark in this state and make its mark in, in this nation and therefore the world. Um, I am excited to work with you all. I encourage you all to visit my website, www.jaredfordayton.com. Um, read my uh, platform at uh, jaredfordayton.com slash Jared's Plans. Um, and feel free to contact me at any time. Again, thank you, League of Women Voters, for this um, opportunity. Thank you. Ms. Duncan. Well, thank, thanks for inviting all of us and having this forum this morning. You know, Dayton needs visionaries, like the Wright brothers, right? Right, the, like the Kettering. And the pieces are out there. The dots are out there. We need someone not only committed, but understand what the dots are and connect them. And uh, Dayton, it has 
a long history of um, factories and, and laborers. And w we can recreate that with, with the jobs that are coming to Wright Patterson with our corridor, the I-75, I-70, and I-675 corridor. We need to generate uh, a strategy plan for our 90 minute market. It existed in the early 70s and we need to dust, dust it off on the shelf. It's there in the city manager's office and recreate, recreate a 90 minute market. Cause we, with e-commerce, that's why our, our uh, different um, malls are closing is because people are changing how they go about buying and uh, uh, purchasing goods and services. And our water quality, we need to continue on, on uh, making sure that those chemicals are, are not going into our water. And we need to create uh, neighborhoods which are vital and will attract people. We need to address all the housing issues and give opportunities for our citizens to obtain uh, houses and and live in them that are for, that are from the city residents. Thank you, Mrs. Um, thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Fairchild. Thank you, Peggy. Um, I want to highlight a couple of things. I appreciate the work that the League of Women Voting is doing on redistricting. I was proud to work with you all to get those that legislation passed. It's critical that we get fair dra uh, maps drawn because the state legislature is gonna make critical decisions going forward in terms of um, how income and cities are gonna be funded. And quite frankly, we need the local government fund restored to some degree so that we can have more um, revenue, particularly in what appears to be a very difficult um, horizon. And I also, one of my proudest moments is working with the League of Women Voters on expanding voter rights here in, in, in Dayton and, and the state. I was part of the settlement that guaranteed our early voting periods, our weekend votings, our evening um, hours so that we can, so all citizens have fair access to the ballot. Um, I also wanna talk about issue eight. We haven't talked about our water. A few, we, there's been a few mentions about it. Out of the six charter amendment changes that are coming, issue eight is the most critical from my perspective. It's one that I initiated and saw through to getting it on the ballot. What it will do will protect our public utility but from being privatized. We've seen other locales where private investors have come in, they bought the utility and rights to water, and then they reduce services and increase costs and the system um, becomes compromised. We can't, allow, we can't allow that to happen. And so issue eight would do that. It puts it in the charter where the only way it can be changed is by a vote of the citizens. So I encourage everyone to vote yes on eight. Eight is great, vote yes on eight. Um, I'm running, I'm Daryl Fairchild, I'm Commissioner Daryl Fairchild. I have a track record of working for our city, for our neighborhoods, for my priorities, seeing things through. I ask for your vote on May 4th or during this early voting period. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fairchild. Um, Ms. turner Loss. Yes. Uh, thank you, Ms. Peggy. I really appreciate the opportunity. I also want to thank DATV and the League in its entirety. Um, again, my name is Shanice Turner-Sloss. I am a candidate for Dayton City Commission, <clears throat> and I'm standing on the tall shoulders of Abner Ornick, Ornick also uh, Commissioner Dean Lovelace, as well as Commissioner Booty Neal. And so I'm saying to the residents in the city of Dayton, we have a diverse panel here. We have a number of, of uh, candidates who have um, uh, passionately articulated the reason why they should be the next Dayton City Commission. And I'm simply telling you all this. You have the power. What I'm asking for is the authority to govern for the will of the people. I have the experience along with the passion. I have been doing the work for over 15 years and I'm committed to continue doing the work. And so what I'm asking is that you be intentional about who you vote for. Let's get beyond the party politics. Let's put people in place that are really truly authentic and that have altruistic goals of making sure that the people in this community are put and seen as a priority. We have not seen that. We have to do better about who we put in office 
we are at a pivotal point. We have $147 million coming into the city of Dayton. If we do not choose and select the right people in place, we will once again squander those dollars and 10 to 15 years down the line, we'll be same, in the same predicament, trying to figure out how do we reinvest in people? How do we address the ills in our community? How do we rebuild our infrastructure? How do we rebuild our neighborhoods? We gotta get it right this time. My name is Shanice turner Slaws. I am the next Dayton City Commission. I encourage each and every one of you to visit my website, ShaniceForDayton.com. You can also check us out on all of the social media uh, platforms. Call me, I'm willing to hear your concerns. I wanna talk to you. I don't have all the answers. I wanna hear from you, 937-701-7137. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. turner Slaws. Thank you all for your participation today and good luck with your campaigns. The League of Women Voters encourages all candidates to run on an issues-oriented campaign. Our goal is to educate the voting public and strengthen our electoral political process. A virtual voter's guide will be available on our website by mid-April. Early voting for the upcoming primary begins April 6th, that was yesterday, at your Board of Elections, or you can request an absentee ballot. However, you decide to vote, your opinion matters, and you help make our democracy work. Thank you for coming. Thank you.